My name is Reverend Edward Livingston. I am a graduate of Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia. I graduated in the year 2007. Uh, since that time, I went straight into what's called faith-based community organizing. And uh, I actually did uh, that first um, experience in Columbus, Ohio, uh, with an organization known as the Bread Organization, Building Responsibility, uh, Equity, and Dignity. And uh, that was part of uh, the DART network, Direct Action and Resource and Training. And uh, I spent about a year and a half there helping uh, members and community through congregations largely explore how their faith calls them to rebuild community, uh, to put justice at the center of their work. Uh, the kind of things that we uh, impacted uh, dealt, with, uh, dealt with community members who were uh, being incarcerated um, to fuel, uh, out of fueling their drug habit actually and how we got involved in, in changing or making that a focal point is that members of community were receiving break-ins and the police department was constantly arresting and then releasing and arresting and releasing um, people who were fueling this drug habit. Mm -hmm. And as part of the faith community, instead of um, continuing that cycle, we began asking the question, what's at the core of why these arrests are taking place? What's at the core of why these break-ins are taking place? So instead of vilifying members of community who are getting caught up with the law, we began to embrace them and explore what their pain is. And so that allowed us uh, to, to uncover that it was a cycle that the prosecutor's office didn't like because they were overworked. It's a cycle that the police department didn't like because they were overworked. And so we were able to um, uh, bring shelters and uh, people who help people with addictions and police department and prosecutors to the same room and as well as the court system to the same room and explore what we can do differently about it and found that there was an example in New Jersey that dealt with drug courts and we replicated and made uh, for Columbus, Ohio an example of drug courts that work for us and we were able to break that cycle. And so there were members of community who were getting the help. Uh, what I mean by breaking that cycle is, instead of going to prison when that kind of nonviolent crime took place, they had an alternative to get direct help with addiction. And the direct help with addiction and the requirements were actually more stringent than what jail involved, the amount of check-ins and going before a cohort and going before a judge. And so we had people in community who were otherwise written off who actually were reclaiming their human dignity and actually becoming gainfully employed within the community. So um, that was a, a, an amazing reward or part of the reward that helped me understand and explore how we're helping to reclaim human dignity. I then transitioned in uh, 2008, uh, late 2008, uh, to an uh, opportunity that was available in Camden, New Jersey. And that was part of Camden Churches Organized for People, which is a part of the PICO National Network, People Improving Communities Through Organizing. And it's in that venue, in my current venue, that I began uh, having my eyes opened to just how pervasive uh, systems are in, in, de in devouring families. Or, or what I mean by devouring families is Camden as a city has had 40 years of disinvestment. And that disinvestment uh, had a migration of community, of taxpaying community, of largely Caucasian community who created the suburbs that became uh, Cherry Hill as we know it today. And so there was a transfer of resources. And unfortunately, when that transfer of resources, who were left behind in the city, which is the, the, the county seat actually for Camden County, who were left in, um, in the city without the, the jobs and the tax base uh, and the resources to make a city thrive were largely African American and Latino and lower income or poor uh, Caucasian. And so that mixture creates a, a concentration of poverty, a vacuum. And so um, for the past 40 years, uh, prior to my uh, coming on board there, uh, what part of what that has meant is that the state has been largely paying uh, resources to help keep that city alive. And so um, I'll just give you one fact, that the city needs more than $138 million to run its budget. 
it's only able to, to raise 21 million on its own accord. Mm. So everything else comes from external sources, which then creates a scapegoat or um, a response uh, from surrounding counties that look at Camden as a sieve that's taking resources away from the rest of the state, which also begins to dehumanize the people who are in the city. And part of what our ministry is, is helping to have people reclaim human dignity, create a counter narrative to the narr that narrative I've just described, show that there are people, if given opportunity, that can uh, step out in, in, in human and God-given dignity and create the kind of change that's needed. Um, one example of that uh, in working with the congregations that are in Camden uh, is that we've pioneered a, an innovative um, health care program that actually takes looking at how health is delivered in a city that has half of the, the, uh, the resident population that must unfortunately use the emergency room as primary care because there, are no, there aren't enough other doctors in the city and the transportation barriers prevent them from moving outside the city to get, them, to get that primary care. What we've done is uh, connected with both the local hospitals and regional partners to rewrite what care looks like, to create a patient-centered model. So it's been two and a half years in the running of convincing and sitting down with and talking with hospital CEOs and CFOs and the like, and having community members who are actually part of those research meetings, we call them, and demonstrating the needs of community and how the care is actually impacting community. And the wonderful thing is we actually got to sit down with doctors and ask doctors, how's the, the care delivery model working for you? And so you had doctors who were frustrated on one side patients who were frustrated on the other side, hospital administrators who were trying to fill beds or run a hospital system. And the result is that we've created uh, what has, um, with our partners, has become uh, an accountable care organization. <clears throat> and what accountable care organization does, it's a geographic area that includes the hospitals that are within our area. It creates the space for a community board to have substantive input as to how dollars um, through the healthcare system, primarily through Medicaid, dollars through the healthcare system are being applied to community. And being that we are working with primarily low-income family members from the city of Camden, their efforts and their getting exposed to uh, the, the skills of community organizing, they're doing the research and connecting with members from Tennessee and. Uh, connecting with um, hospital systems from other cities and states, and inviting colleagues from across the country to take a, a journey with us, we've been able to actually, in some instances, reduce the cost of healthcare delivery, increase the patient uh, input to the, to the care that gets delivered. Uh, and to give you an example of that, there's a high rise that I'll only use as an example that uh, had a high concentration of emergency room visitors for primary care. So what we basically did was go, went floor to floor and sat in the lobby and just introduced ourselves, made sure that they understood that uh, there's someone who cares about their well-being. This wasn't medical staff. This is organizing staff and other volunteers that are learning how to do this. And when, when the human contact produced enough uh, return where they'd sit with us, we'd share with them some of the ouch numbers. You know, the ouch numbers include that there was $19 million over the course of a year that was billed and received by the hospital for primary care for residents in that building. And so we just asked the question, do you feel that you received $19 million worth of health care? You know, how was that experience? And that was a close enough question to open eyes and to begin people asking, uh, to get people to ask more questions about how is care being delivered, what are our options and alternatives, and to wrap up this example, through the uh, residents of this building and connecting with the owner of this building, they were able to dream that the hospital that's six blocks away might as well be six miles away. If they could have a doctor or a nurse practitioner or someone that was in the building, 
then that would be one of the short-term measures that would help them get more healthy because they would be able to build up a trust with the staff. No one said that that would happen. Do you know the hurdles that, that are created in that? And between the residents of the building, the building owner, um, our healthcare partners, it, local in the environment, part of the hospital system there, and an innovative uh, private practitioner, we all developed a model that could bring a, a health practitioner into the building. They use private dollars to renovate the building, to, reno to renovate a, a section of the building for, uh, for health care, to create uh, examination rooms. And um, the short of it is that about half the building made that medical home their, their home, driving down health care costs, driving down emergency room visits. So um, that's an example. I'm Bishop Dwayne Royster. I am the senior pastor of the Living Water United Church of Christ located in the Oxford Circle section of Philadelphia and also the executive director of POWER, Philadelphians Organized to Witness, Empower, or Rebuild, which is a 41 congregation faith-based organizing uh, movement here in the city of Philadelphia affiliated with the PICO National Network and the Partnership for Working Families. That is a racial and economic justice organization committed to making sure that people who experience pain and struggle the most in the city of Philadelphia have a say in their collective destiny so that they can help to determine the direction that they want the city and their communities to be able to move in. I'm uh, Katie Day and I am the Charles A. Sheeran Professor of Church and Society here. Um, I always like to put the name of the chair, Charles A. Sheeran, there because Charles A. Sheeran was uh, a one-term mayor in Brooklyn mm. during the reform movement and he said he just wanted as a person of faith to serve one term and try to clean up some of the corruption. So I wear that label proudly. I've been on the faculty here since 1985. Um, and in the 1990s, what's so exciting for me to be here today is that in the 1990s, we developed the Metro Urban Ministry Concentration. And what this essentially is, is a way for people preparing for ministry to have a major, uh, a concentration in Metro Urban Ministry. Uh, Phil Cray and I designed this program out of our hip pocket, really, um, uh, designed around what we wish we had known when we went into urban ministry. And so one of the major pieces that we wish somebody had mentioned when we were preparing to go out as young pastors in the city was faith-based community organizing. So, uh, so it is so gratifying to be here with two uh, graduates of ours. Um, Ed was a student in the poverty seminar, I remember. And um, uh, because this is what we hope our program will uh, contribute to. So when students are sitting in classrooms and they're learning about poverty, mm -hmm. it's not just a kind of abstract analysis. Um, even when we talk about theological concepts of empowerment and solidarity with the poor, this is not abstract. This is real on the street. Uh, ministry and implications. And so part of our program is to require uh, training in faith-based community organizing. Uh, there are four major um, uh, organizing networks, the IAF, PICO, which these guys are both part of, uh, DART and Gamaliel, made famous by uh, President Obama. Um, he I mean, they were famous in their own right, I should say, before he, he uh, was an organizer with them. Uh, but in, that, uh, in these immersions, uh, what we're trying to do is really help give students a glimpse of the skills and the possibilities of faith-based community organizing. Um, one thing that's so exciting for me, um, I'm a sociologist and right now there's a lot of buzz about the rise of the nuns. And the nuns are those people with no religious preference. And there are uh, lots of numbers out there about attendance and membership declining in churches. 
And yet, at the very same time, where there is growth is in faith-based community organizations. So people are not individualistic, jaded, cynical dropouts. They are saying the church is not doing it. I'm not feeling my right. faith come alive. Mm -hmm. And so in one of the mantras in faith-based organizing is that you're praying on your feet. So as you're marching or, or waiting in a um, hospital waiting room and talking to people as you're learning leadership skills, as you're on a uh, vigil on the street, you're, it is a form of, uh, of expression and living out your faith. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to do in our academic program and to see the fruits of the labor of, of uh, graduates who are re not only involved in faith-based community <coughs> organizing, but leaders, and very important leaders in, um, in our region, is very gratifying. Um, what's gratifying for a teacher is not having a great lesson plan and a you know, scintillating lecture, which I did, right, always. Yes, did. But, um, <laughs> but uh, is this, is to see that people can take tools. We don't teach everything there is to know, but if we can kind of set people in the right direction and then see them live out and grow in making a real difference uh, among the poor in this region and other regions, in working for justice, being strong leaders, clear-headed, theologically based, that's, um, that's what, why we do what we do. Prior to coming to Lutheran, I was doing this work already. I've been doing it since, uh, you know, I first went into ministry back in 1991. So this is not new to the work that I do. I've been very involved in social justice movements. Um, my grandmother was a member of Zion Baptist Church as a when, I, when I was a child. Leon Sullivan was the pastor there, right? So I kind of come out of this mold of a social justice church, an African-American social justice church that really engages both the direct service component and also pushing towards policies that would empower and engage uh, communities of color to be able to grow and be able to own their own community. Um, but I would say that seminary and being here at Lutheran in particular gave me uh, a framework to be able to ask the question why and the question the legitimacy of every narrative that we hear and experience every single day. And I think that that's, that was a very big part of uh, my experience here. I mean, not only question the legitimacy of what we did in the seminary, but, but being able to take those tools and to be able to use critical reasoning and thinking to be able to ask questions about why this is, to not to be satisfied with it, and to really be able to stand in our faith and understanding the ministry of Christ, understanding the, you know, the call of God, to not be satisfied with what we see and that it can be better. So I would say seminary um, and all the professors, never had Dr. Day, but all the professors, I think, in a very real way, and you know, even from the teaching of Martin Luther himself, was really able to help us ask the question why, question the legitimacy of things, and then the press for a better solution. My experience was uh, similar here at Lutheran. Uh, not only did it help me ask the question why, but it helped me wrestle with uh, biblical texts that I had uh, held dear to me. Like I take Micah 6 and 8, what does the Lord require, right? But to do justice, okay, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And so in my background in church experiences, I can say that, you know, I was being faithful. You know, our churches were faithful. 52 Sundays out of a year were always there, Bible studies, a lot of things that we're doing. Uh, then when you talk about um, uh, loving kindness or service, you know, the different ministries that take place, you know, you have uh, your clothing and your education, your educating and your uh, meeting different needs. But what did it mean and what does it mean to do justice, right? right? And so yeah. that is part of the exploration that I was able to spend dedicated time uh, in tension with professors and, and colleagues, students, and the like, to really flesh out what that means. Uh, prior to seminary experience, I had also been working in community and asking the questions. It was around uh, prior to my uh, starting seminary. That's when all the, the, the other epidemic of gun ho homicides were taking place. And I couldn't just sit on my hands to, to do nothing about that. And I'm looking at what the church's response to this is. And I did what I knew how to do, organize people to come together. 
right? So we had people from academia and people from community groups and people from the church coming around roundtables and discussing why is this happening and what could be done about it. Now, what organizing taught me, something that I, I didn't have the tool set then, is the action component. Not only taking the research that you do, uh -huh. but, but an organized event to, to name the nemesis, right? To name the, the key parties that may be able to make a change around a given uh, problem and to press that, press for a solution. So that's part of what uh, organizing uh, taught me. I'm the chairperson currently of Heeding God's Call to End Gun Violence, um, which is different than broad-based organizing. It's issue organizing, but I have to say that uh, I was preceded in this role by <laughs> this guy, Dwayne, who was the uh, chairperson um, That's right. two years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, I became uh, the chair the week of Sandy Hook and the week before I started my sabbatical, and it completely took over my sabbatical. Um, <clears throat> Heating Guys Call is an organization that is organizing people of faith, all faiths, uh, Jewish, Muslim, uh, Christian, Catholic, Protestant, um, Sikhs, uh, whomever, to um, uh, to witness to the fact that it, uh, the, the carnage that we're seeing in our city does not have to be this way and is not God's will. Mm -hmm. And people of faith can do much more and have to do more than funerals and pastoral care, mm -hmm. which is what we've always done. Right. And so uh, in Philadelphia, I'm sure in um, Camden, Camden well. because Camden, uh, ha New Jersey has very good gun laws, but uh, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania do not. And so the gun buyers come across the bridge and load up. And we uh, so we're that, yeah. arming Camden as well. So what Heating God's Call does is try to intervene at the point of sale uh, at gun shops and get gun shops to uh, stand against those straw buyers who come in and the gun shop owners know that they're going to go sell these weapons on the street. Um, so we're try we have faithful witnesses at gun shops. We do uh, murder site witnesses where we go once a month to, um, to a place where there has been a murder. And we have an interfaith service um, to pray for the person, the family, the traumatized neighborhood, to tell the neighborhood, uh, you're not isolated, you're not alone. This is all of our issue, and we're standing with you. And to say, it doesn't have to be this way, and to try and get that message out to city government and to other movers and shakers. Our, our um, chapter in Harrisburg does this after every murder, because gun murder, because they have 30 to 35 a year. Here in Philadelphia um, in 2012, we had 288 gun murders. So we can't keep up with that. We do once a month at different parts of the city. I have uh, crossed paths with uh, Marilis Rodriguez several times. Um, the ministry that she does is so needed. Uh, there are so many uh, women in, in Camden who are finding their, their way to Camden from other, other townships. And uh, they're unfortunately horribly uh, in a position of selling their bodies to survive. And um, uh, Marilis has continues to be a godsend in helping these women see that there's another path, that uh, God loves them, and that there are those that can put their arms around them. Uh, and the ministry that, that she does complements the ministry that a number of our churches do all up um, and down uh, Broadway. So, uh, yeah, definitely a, a strong warrior for Christ. Faith-based community organizing is critical because, one, the faith community is the one place where there are large numbers of gathered people every week. Um, and most people come to a faith community because they're looking for hope. They're looking for uh, trying to figure out 
you know, if they're not just coming to, you know, to get food or clothing or things like that, they're coming to get their souls nourished. They're coming to try to figure out why they should get up the next morning, the next day. That community, faith-based community organizing becomes critical because I think, you know, as an African-American, as a person that's grown up in the city of Philadelphia, um, a person that has lived all over this city, um, in particular communities which struggle very deeply and, are, and people are in a great deal of pain, um, you know, Cornell West in his book Prophesied Deliverance talk about the pervasive nihilism in Philadelphia, that pervasive sense of hopelessness that's just overwhelming. Um, Faith-based community organizing does a couple of things, right? It, it, it pulls on our traditions that cause us to lean towards hope. But then it also, in that same moment of leaning towards hope and helping people uh, to lean towards justice, as you talked about earlier with Micah 6.8, it also then causes us to help people to be able to see that um, trying to f get fed, trying to have clothing, trying to have shelter every day is just as critical as working towards trying to change the policies that keep them from getting food and from getting clothing and from having shelter every day. And that oftentimes what happens in our communities that struggle the deepest, they don't work towards these issues because they don't think they have any influence or capacity to change it. And what faith-based community organizing comes through is uses the framework of our sacred text to help them to understand that the power that God has given them innately can be used to create dramatic change in their community. And not only dramatic change in their community for others, but change for themselves. And that they become leaders of hope within their own communities that can, they can bring about. So, you know, some of the work that we're doing with power around immigration reform or around a battle for a living wage and trying to help low wage workers be able to get living wages or the fact that we're working right now and partnering with other groups, a community, a Gamaliel group across the state of Pennsylvania to create a uh, campaign around a full fair funding formula for uh, school districts across the state of Pennsylvania because our schools are so underfunded. And being able to say the folk that think they don't have any power, we have more power together, even in the midst of our struggle, than we do if we do nothing. And so helping people to be able to find hope, to be able to claim their hope, and then be able to put that hope to work to be able to change their circumstances, I think is really a powerful part of what we do in faith-based community organizing and why it's so critical. Yes. But it also helps to uh, deepen the text so it's not just something we hear on Sunday, mm -hmm. but it's something we live Monday through Sunday. Um, and have that experience. That's right. The communities that we share together, and when we talk about the most vulnerable sure. in our communities, sure. they're often the canary in the coal mine. That's right. You know, I mean, I, I often say that um, as Camden goes, so does, so does the nation. So do, so do cities of the nation. If you continue to ignore or 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 not be, or or not believe that um, together we can achieve more than separate. If you continue to allow uh, policies that are written that, that strip certain communities and apply you know, a bounty to other communities, if, if that continues and, and, and we don't see that when we talk about building the kingdom of God, right? Mm -hmm. When we talk about on earth as it is in heaven, at least as I interpret that, that means that I, I have a, a sense and a part to do now. I, I cannot sit by and wait for the by and by for for experiencing sure. relief. Um, so, so these things are critical to make sure that people who are closest to the pain have both a teaching and a path to walk with their neighbor. And as I read the text, all are my neighbor, okay? And if all are my neighbor, then we have to look at, if, if someone is hurting, then I am hurting. That's right. And so how is it that we're working together Monday through Sunday how is it that we're wrestling with the text together and looking at, so the text says that we are our brothers and sisters keeper, right? So how are we living that out Monday through, mm -hmm. Monday through Sunday? And then when I look at uh, a Camden example, of uh, there are 12,000, there's about 1,200, excuse me, there are about 1,200 people being released from prison each year that come just to the city of Camden. It's more across the state, but just to the city of Camden. What are we doing to welcome them? What are we doing? What's our role to make sure that when they enter community, that they're being embraced? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I do think in being your brother and your sister's keeper that we have an obligation to look at, um, again, here's how policies matter. If the policy says that when you, when you are released from prison, that you are remanded to the very 
neighborhood, the very zip code that has the highest homicide and homis, highest rearrest rate. Something's wrong with that. Mm -hmm. We're funneling people into a barrel to be shot down. Mm -hmm. So that's where faith community gets to come in and change and challenge the thinking around policy. It doesn't make anyone the, the bad person, so to speak, but some things don't add up and make sense. So that, that's in one respect how and why we're embracing our returning citizens and making sure that they have the opportunity to look at policies that can help them reintegrate into community. Part of what faith-based community organizing does for clergy in particular is that it helps us to reclaim the prophetic voice. Um, I think that in many circumstances, and like in seminary, we're taught the pastoral role and the pastoral voice. Mm -hmm. But the Bible is both full of pastoral and prophetic, and they are equally important in the journey. And so, you know, the faith-based community organizing helps to train, helps to teach, helps to empower faith leaders to be able to reclaim the prophetic voice, the voice of the Old Testament prophets, the voice of the, uh, of the prophets of the New Testament, the, the, the reclaim that voice to be able to speak truth to power and stand with moral and ethical and faith-filled authority to be able to say to the president or to the governor or to the mayor or to city council or the state legislature or the Congress, you know, thus says the Lord. And to be able to do so with bold conviction uh, you know, in, in being able to say that God cares about these issues and that when you vote as a person who votes, you're voting and it's going to impact people. And we believe that the divine creator of the universe has a say in this matter. And we want to share with you what that is. Mm -hmm. I think for far too long, at least the last 30, 40 years, though, you know, since really the end of the civil rights movement, to some extent, we have not really leaned into that prophetic voice. And so now is a moment when we are actually able to get back to the prophetic voice, to be able to lift it up again, especially as we see the, uh, the distance between the quote unquote haves and the quote unquote have nots increase, we believe that God's got something to say about that. And it's very clearly laid out in the text. We need to be able to bring that to the surface and be able to speak that truth because capitalism and, and is not God. God is God. And we need to be able to speak that truth um, in all the venues that we find ourselves in and to be able to pull, hold those uh, secular authorities in check uh, by the, the voice of the prophetic faith community. Power launched in 2011. Um, we launched with a campaign around um, low wage workers and around jobs, around particularly the Philadelphia airport. It was getting ready to go through a $6 billion expansion. Um, we recognized that uh, the airport is surrounded by Southwest Philadelphia and sections of South Philadelphia that are highly impoverished. And we had a great concern that $6 billion worth of investment was going into the airport and it was not going to positively impact those neighborhoods. Um, we began having conversations with workers at the airport and um, actually partnered with uh, two other service unions and began having more and more conversations with workers down there. And this one particular worker, I won't say her name because I don't have her permission to share that, but um, you know, spent a lot of time talking with her. She has worked as a ground service employee at the airport uh, pushing wheelchairs for seven years. She started there, uh, she was making minimum wage, and seven years later, she's still making minimum wage. Um, and the, the real challenge is, and I should say, it's, it's minimum wage on paper only. She actually only makes five bucks an hour. But they're supposedly tips are supposed to make up the difference. But they're not allowed to ask for tips. Uh, the employees are not allowed to ask for tips. And so sometimes the employer will have them pad their, uh, pad their, their, their time card and to say they got tips even though they didn't get them. Um, you know, to listen to these stories, and this is not a young woman, she's in her mid-50s, but she's pushing people in wheelchairs back and forth across the airport, and, and there are hundreds of workers that are down there like this, making less than minimum wage. Um, you know, we were pushing for a policy that would force uh, the airlines down there to make sure that all subcontracted workers were making at least uh, minimum wage. In Philadelphia, which is really interesting, Philadelphia passed a law a few years ago called the 21st Century Wage and Benefit Act, which basically said that anybody that's contracted with Philadelphia and in a contract to do work for Philadelphia is supposed to pay at minimum 150% of the minimum wage, which is 10 to 80 an hour, plus benefits. So what happened is we, the, anybody that's at the airport, the airport is wholly owned by Philadelphia. Anybody that's contracted with Philadelphia has to be able to pay that 10 to 80 an hour. The way they got around that, you hire subcontractors.
So we've actually been working on moving legislation, and the workers have been down there fighting with us to move legislation that require that any subcontractor to the nth degree that is in a contractor relationship with a general contractor who's contracted with Philadelphia, I know this sounds complicated, but it's really not, has to pay this 1088 minimum uh, an hour. For some people at the airport, um, and this is going to be voted on May 20th of, of this year, uh, those folk at the airport, some of those folk will get 100% raise and get benefits that are paid for for the first time, right, in part. That's going to have a major impact in those low-income communities that are right around the airport. Philadelphia has 30% poverty. 40% of the kids in Philadelphia go to bed hungry every night. Mm -hmm. People are trying to raise families off of working full-time, making minimum wage, and they can't do it. They still need medical assistance. They still need food stamps. And all we're doing is really just writing another uh, tax subsidy to the, the major corporations that should be paying these people decently so they can survive. And so we feel that our work is about economic dignity. If you work 40 hours a week full time, you should be able to live decently right. off of that and take care of a family. And so, you know, I think of this one woman, she's spoken at some of our conventions. She's been a very powerful force. And I can't wait to the day on May 21st after the referendum passes and then we can look forward to saying to her, in just a couple of months, you're going to start making 10 a.m. an hour because the law says you have to do it. That's what faith-based organizing does. It will affect 1,500 workers at the Philadelphia airport whose salaries will go up. Some of them will double, some of them will get three and two dollars more an hour as a result of this law being changed. That has direct implication and impact back in their homes, back in their local communities, for their children, for their neighbors. Right. It has a whole uh, uh, impact in the economics of a whole neighborhood. That's what faith-based community organizing does. That's what being able to ask the question why and, the question, and, and to be able to challenge the legitimacy of the systems and the laws that we have, and, you know, learning that in a seminary environment is a powerful tool for us to be able to uh, go forward and create change in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, Luther nailed his thesis on the wall. And we do the same thing in that same prophetic voice, offering the same hope to the people so that they can have a say in their own collective destiny. One way of wording, where is God in this and where are all these efforts going, is that I do believe the, the systems and structures uh, that, that govern health of a community are fundamentally broken. They've, they've been abused for quite some time. And to a large part, they're being left unchecked. And being left unchecked, we're finding all the things that you hear about the 1% versus the 99%, the gap increasing between, increasing between the haves and the have-nots. If we don't put faith to our faith, if we don't continue to ring out what saith the Lord, if we don't lay claim prophetically to how we can reinsert ourselves in community, church is not meant to be the four walls separated from community. But if we don't do that, it's only going to get worse. Not only will you have uh, the, the lower income communities being further uh, oppressed, but you already see the signs now. There are people I talk to in, in suburbia, if you will, that are struggling. There are more families now that are struggling to make ends meet. That is only going to get worse if we don't act on our faith values to be about restoring community. And I think that's ultimately where this is going. And I think we can name it in ways such as social determinants of health. I think we can name it in ways of underemployment and unemployment and what efforts we can be a part of to, to, to germinate opportunity. Capitalism is still here. People still want to make a profit. So I believe that we can realign. We can reinsert ourselves and help realign people so that more can be employed, uh, so that more... Uh, can, can find, I think teachers are, are an excellent example of where we can go with this. They're being charged, I, this is my opinion, they're being charged to care in many cases for 20, 30, 40 people in a room at a time, and where in too many cases is the sense of community, right? Uh, my brother here spoke earlier about parents who have to work two or three part-time jobs which pulls them out of the home, okay? Further keeping them away from correcting and steering their child and being a partner in that, in that uh, uh, creating the opportunity for the future. 
So I think the social determinants, the jobs, the education, and making sure in the jobs that you're talking about a living wage and people exercising their voice through the vote so that lawmakers who ultimately determine resources that go or don't go into community and businesses that uh, either have say to where those resources go or, or what breaks they get, I think ultimately they're all these things bleed together, and that's why it matters that the prophetic voice is front and center. I'm wondering if, if, if we aren't in that prophetic moment um, when, you know, after the economic crisis, after, um, you know, we, we, we vote in the first African-American president, people are seeing now race in a very different way. Uh, we've discovered that we're really not in a post-racial society by any means, um, that race is still a very big factor. I wonder if we are at a moment in the course of American history and human history where we will see the pendulum begin to swing back again towards justice and towards equity and towards fairness. Um, and at least that's what my prayer is, that we're in that place um, to begin to see that that, uh, that that pendulum swings back in the other direction and I believe that part of the reason we have, as Dr. Day pointed out earlier, the nuns mm -hmm. who have no religious affiliation is because the church has become isolated and has not been willing to go out into the public square and to proclaim truth and proclaim justice and to proclaim grace and to proclaim mercy. Um, and that we have to engage in the public square in a way that's both pastoral and prophetic, mm -hmm. that is both uh, you know, calling people to live right, but at the same time calling systems to act right uh, towards people. And I think we'll see the nuns re-engage as the faith communities begin to own that peace again and not abdicate their responsibility to the democratic process, but keep in tension the, the, the secular government with the faith government and continue to push things forward. So I'm believing, I'm hopeful um, in this moment, in much the same way that the civil rights movement took years to build up steam and energy and the, the pain and the angst of the people got to the point it boiled over and required a response. I think we're in that same moment. Uh, when we looked at the Occupy movement, when we look at other um, things that are taking place, people are looking for hope. And this is the place where hope is. And I believe that uh, without a shadow of a doubt that the faith-based community organizing is going to be one of those tools that God can use from all faith traditions. I mean, power, uh, just like CCOP, we're multi-faith. We're not just Christian, but, you know, we're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, mm -hmm. and um, even have secular humanists as a part of our organization. So the ethical, ethical human society. Um, but that in this moment, in this very sacred moment, uh, people are coming together and saying, there's a better way. And that better way is not just one way, but it's all of us coming together. And for all those of us who are faith-filled people, believing that our faith compels us, propels us, causes us to jump forward, speak truth, and to bring truth to our communities. I was uh, voted in to Norristown Council as a councilman at large for the municipality. There's seven council people. Norristown does not have a mayor, so the head of the government is the president of uh, Norristown Council. It was a friend of mine, Gary Simpson. Um, you know, I served on council for uh, just a short period of time because I actually uh, was called to lead power simultaneously, and it was a bit much trying to do that in Philly and be a councilman in Norristown. I can say, um, that it was very helpful seeing the other side of government and the, the, all the issues that legislators and, and uh, pol political leaders have to wrestle with on a daily basis, the competing interests, the, the, the issues that people come up with, the concerns that they have. Um, sometimes, to be honest with you, feeling a little hopeless uh, because the concerns that people have you want to fix, but you recognize you don't even have the power to fix some of those things. And, but also, at the same time, recognizing that there are moments when there are issues you can fix, but if you don't have the political will of everybody in that room or everybody sitting on that council to make it happen, then it doesn't happen. Um, and so wrestling with that in a, a deeper way. I mean, I served Norristown. I really appreciated the opportunity to do that, and I hope I served to the best of my ability. But to be honest with you, I felt that I had more capacity to create change through faith-based organizing. <laughs> than I did as a councilman sitting in Norristown uh, City Council. Um, and I'm still utterly convinced of that today. Um, you know, just believing that we're moving things in a much more powerful way, larger way, and using the influence of, of faith 
and also the influence of n large numbers of people to be able to convince legislators, convince the mayor, convince the governor and others that the issues that we're talking about that are coming from the people, they're not coming from us, they're coming from the people, are the issues that they need to be concerned with and making changes about. So, yeah, I appreciated serving on the Arstown Council. It was interesting being both a faith leader and a politician, uh, you know, simultaneously. And I will say that church politics, though, I think still a little rougher. But uh, <laughs> that, that um, you know, I'm not sure that I want to go that route again, though. Because I also serve as a suffragan bishop at Higher Ground Christian Fellowship International. And I should say that Living Water United Church of Christ is a UCC church, but we were a non-denominational church before we joined the United Church of Christ. And we were a part of a fellowship of churches called Higher Ground Christian Fellowship International, where I'm a suffragan bishop. Um, and so, yeah, that, I mean, that's another role that I carry as a general secretary for Higher Ground um, and partnering with our, our presiding bishop, uh, Kermit Newkirk, who is actually instrumental in getting the the uh, certificate programs here at, at Urban Theological Institute, um, you know, and having a real passion. But also, I really appreciate having the opportunity in that role, helping to lead other pastoral leaders into owning both this prophetic and pastoral vision for what the church should be. Um, because I think that, again, it's, I mean, we can preach on Sunday, we can do Bible study, we can do the visitations and the marriages and the funerals and uh, you know, the baptisms and do communion and all those things. And I think that those are incredibly important to our faith, right? Those are the things that give us strength. But we have to do the hard work of the prophetic. And um, we don't have, I, I don't feel like we have a lot of leaders that are really pushing toward the prophetic edge. You know, we have social justice committees in our congregations, but we don't have a major push towards justice within our congregations. As a matter of fact, for many of us, especially those in the mainline traditions, right, we do everything we can to fly out of communities that struggle. And this is a moment when we can embrace going in and embrace the pain and then allow that to be used as a tool to create collective change. Um, and so I, I want to help to model that before other leaders, that we have the pastoral vision, but we also have the prophetic vision, and we need to lean into them both equally. <laughs>